and a doctorate. Dr. Steven Salvaraju holds a licentiate and a doctorate in theology with a specialization in catechetics and youth ministry from the Pontifical Silesian University in Rome, Italy. So uh, the Pontifical University means that the university is directly under the Pope himself. So presently, he serves as the director of the Archdiocesan Catechetical Center, the Archdiocese of Kuala Lumpur. Before he was director of this catechetical center, he was um, he he was also uh, he he was the director of the Penang Diocesan Pastoral Institute. He was also a lecturer at Sunway uh, University, and uh, before that, uh, he was I think uh, he he had actually been very involved in giving sessions. Um, providing formations for, I think, more than 30 years, Doctor. Yes. So he is a very experienced, um, he's a very experienced formator and my good boss, whom I'm very, 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 very grateful for, that God has sent into my life to guide me. And I hope, um, just, a, just a digression, but he is also the one who uh, started me on my own spiritual journey by the by the by these words he said that the strength of a catechist is the depth of their spirituality and so any catechist needs to take their spirituality seriously and for those words i am here where i am today so i hope that uh, dr steven salvaraju um will be able to uh, will be able to uh, give you a similarly life changing presentation thank you Victor. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Yes, so what Stephanie is saying is that sometimes when a person is presenting, uh, something will strike you. could just be one point. could just be one idea. And this is what uh, I think when, during my prayer, I was talking about the pearl that God will give us. Um, God will give each one of you or God will give many of you to take back that one point that you need to ponder uh, about more deeply. So having said that, I must uh, say to Stephanie that apology, Stephanie. Actually, um, having listened to your session, I was in fact reflecting about it. And having listened listened to your session, I will be presenting the third session, the topic for the third session first, that is scripture and sacred tradition in catechesis. I felt inspired by Stephanie's session to make that change, and the reason being there is, uh, I think, the connection between what Stephanie has shared is. It's basically God's love story, which we often uh, talk about, which we often say is God's revelation. God's revelation. God revealing himself to humanity. There's this deep connection. This is very strong connection. So I would like to start with the topic on scripture, scripture and tradition in catechesis. Now, we may, some of you may be wondering, you may have come today in the hope that you have got some Bible expert, a Bible expert to give you some exegesis and humanetics and and, and all this, this uh, very serious talk about the Bible. But in, in discussing this and praying about this, um, Stephanie and I felt that we would like to... So is my background words are inverted, is it? Is that true? Oh, sorry. Okay, let me change that. You to... need to change your background image, Doctor. There's a mirror. Like... Okay, so, all right. I think this is better. Sorry about that. Okay, so thank you for Rachel for pointing that out. That's why we need lots of eyes. Eyes means not I C E, you know, E Y E S. So, uh, I will begin to share screen now. Let me maximize this. All right, so. One of the difficulties, or one of the difficulties I face when I meet catechists, or not just catechists, parents, when I meet uh, coordinators, when I meet well-meaning people, is they often ask me, Dr. Stephen, when is the MCS series going to be updated? Now, the MCS series is that, that textbook, uh, although we don't like to call it a textbook, but it's actually a resource book. Okay, the resource book that's being used by many of the parishes in Malaysia not just in Peninsula, Malaysia, but Sabah and Sarawak as well. So when is going to be updated? Right? So there's this idea that uh, there's also the textbook, is the resource book or textbook, as we call it, is boring. 
uh, and people say, I don't want to use the textbook because I want to be more creative. I want to take things from the internet and I want to use that as my catechetical content. Now, some say, um, why can't I just use the Bible? After all, the Bible is more exciting. I can have quizzes, I can have role play, I can do a lot of things with the Bible, just with the Bible. And to compare it with the Sunday school that's happening in other churches, because they are, they seem to have, we often say uh, they are, their classes are more exciting, right? Although we, are, we ourselves have, may not have sat there and listened to what's being shared, we sense that compared to our Catholic catechism, uh, it's more exciting. It, it would be more exciting, as we say, the grass is always greener on the other side, or seems greener on the other side. So after all, it's the word of God. Why can't I use the Bible? Why should I, do I need a catechism? And this happening. Some have uh, some have told me, Doctor, I don't use the catechism, I only use the Bible because it's the word of God. Right? And some people say uh, the textbook is outdated. Uh, I don't want to use the catechism. I prefer to teach topics that are more relevant for young people today. So what they do is they put aside the catechism and then they begin to uh, focus. Uh, okay, can someone please off your... Sorry, huh? okay. So they begin to focus on things like LGBT and social media, uh, environment. They say this is this is what is needed today, doctor. We don't need all this uh, updated stuff from the you know from the church. Even uh, last uh, last uh, Sunday, someone came up to me and said, "Doctor, I mean the evangelization team. Can you have more topics on evangelization in the catechism book?" So this is the request I've been hearing. Every time uh, people are coming and giving me suggestions and I keep telling them, I'm no more, I'm, uh, you know, that uh, that a catechism is not just a textbook. Catechism is, uh, what you have is a resource book, actually. It's a resource book. Now, if you look at a catechism, say, a catechism, let's take the catechism of the Catholic Church. If you take any catechism, what you have is basically what the, the, the teachings of the church. The teachings of the church, the life experience. In, in, in MCS book, you see the life experience, right? The first part, if you are familiar with the MCS book, you have the life experience, then you have the, the word of God, that is the second part, and then you have got the faith response, right? Now, in a proper catechism, the first and the third part are non, don't exist in a catechism, should not exist in a catechism. It's actually supposed to be just the content, the content, what you're required to teach the young person. But we add in the life experience, we add in the faith response to make it more user-friendly for the catechist. User-friendly for the catechist. So I'm going to focus on that part that we call the word of God, or we call the part that is, involves the teaching of the church. The part that many people feel is outdated, or the part that many people feel is it's difficult to teach. And I'm going to share with you why that is essential. In fact, it is the most essential part of our catechesis. And if, okay. That is the most essential part of our catechesis. So all that Stephanie has been sharing in the first session regarding God's love is actually what we call God's revelation. And so catechesis, the ministry of catechesis, and your ministry as a catechist is based on God's revelation. Without God's love story, you and I, would, of course, would not be existing. You and I would not be on earth, all right, and all that. But more than that, you and I will not have the catechetical ministry. It is because of God's revelation and because of God's love story. But the question is, okay, let us begin uh, with a more basic question. Let's say a person is, uh, let's talk about a person who is living on an island. He has, he's not a Christian. He doesn't have the Bible. He doesn't know about the mass. He doesn't know anything about Christianity or Islam or or any, any religious, he's, he's not even an atheist. In an atheist is someone who does not believe in God. This man, this person on the island, grew up on the island, he has no connection with the outside world. Only people he knows is that community that in which he lives. There's no connection with any so-called divine, uh, not divine being, with God as we know it. Now, can this person know God? All right, anyone can un unmute your mic and share. Okay, let someone, someone who stay a, a person of uh, in a certain tribe living in deep in the jungle, okay, without any knowledge of, of, of God or Bible, would this person be able to know God? Anyone? I only say God, right? God means it doesn't mean that 
divine being? Would he or she have come to know a divine being or a spiritual being as we, uh, whom we call God? There are some answers in the chat. Uh, okay. Yes, could be from his or her ancestral beliefs. Ancestral think, uh, beliefs. Mm -hmm. I'll probably or... worship a tree that provides me everything. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Anything else, Stephanie? Uh, yes, Margaret said through his creation, Isidore, tribal people worship creation. Um, so far, that's all. Okay, oh, so... According, yes, yes. Uh, there are numerous creations of God present there. Fine mm -hmm. birds, edible food. During mm -hmm. the loneliness, maybe he or she could discover God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we are created right. in God's image. Hence, every human being has a longing for a greater being. Mm -hmm. uh, you will experience the awesomeness of a power you might not awesome, know. Awesome. You're, you're giving very with spiritual our, talks. Huh? With very our good. actions, you will get to know him more. Okay. Are you, are you, okay. All right. So uh, every human being can go can know a divine being. Let's not talk about God as we know God. Let's put that aside. Every created because we are created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, as Stephanie has shared, we are called to love Him and 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 know Him. And a person may know a person may know God in certain ways, according to the Catholic Church. Not just this is to this is to in relation to every human person. Person can know God firstly. Through the physical world, someone if some of you have shared, yes, through creation. When a person looks at creation, the beauty of creation, the orderliness of creation, it's even said, I'm not a scientist, but it's even said if the sun was you know, just a few inches closer to the earth, then the earth would burn up or the earth would become hotter. And if the sun was a few inches further away from the earth, the, uh, the earth would grow colder, would be colder, right? So the orderliness of creation, how God has placed, how the uh, stars and the sun and the moon and, and the the fact that the grass is green and the green has got a purpose. Sometimes I ask myself, why is not the grass blue or red? Okay, but there's a purpose as to why the grass is green, the why the sky is blue. God has put everything in order. So when a human being, regardless of whether he's a Christian or she's a Christian, whether he's a, he's a Hindu or, or a Muslim, looks at creation, able to say there is a divine being. Now you and I have experiences where we have uh, seen the rainbow or seen the sunset and said, what a magnificent creation. Uh, God, how magnificently God has created creation. Now the second way, uh, Stephanie, you remind me of, uh, five minutes from time. All right. The second way is to, to other human persons. When you look at other human beings, you find that there are people with such wonderful qualities, joy, a sense of happiness, sense of ambition, perseverance, strength, even in moments of challenges and disappointment, this person is able to go on. Stephanie asked some very relevant questions earlier. Okay? Even amid sin and in spite of sin, and, and look at the world today, corruption, look at our country today, so many uh, discrimination taking place. There is this human being who constantly strives to be better, strives to make the world a better place. So we can find a lot of qualities characteristics from human beings that we meet and encounter, even within ourselves, divine qualities. So we can know a bit about God through other human beings. And the third way, according to the church, that we can know God is through using our human reason, our human intellect. This is, of course, given to every human being, even a person staying deep in the jungle or a person staying alone in an island has got an intellect and is able or she is able to reason things out. Why is, you know, why? Even though he, he or she may not be able to think uh, like us in a way because we have got all the, the advantage of information, person living deep in the jungle may not have such information, but this person is able to reason out. And that is why they have, uh, like the orang asli, they got certain beliefs. They have certain beliefs. They'll tell you, doctor, jangan petik buah dari buku ini. Do not pluck that fruit, okay? They'll say, do not pluck the fruit from this tree. 
Okay, because of this situation. Now, I will take you to another tree and you can pluck the fruit. So, all this is based on human reasoning. You know, human reasoning based on their culture and based on their ancestors and so on. So, these are the three main ways that, that all human beings can come to know God, regardless of whether they are religious or Christians. All right? Now, what the church also says to us, the human beings still cannot know God fully. Still means even being still today, if you try, we are not able to fully know God, either through creation or human reason or to other, to other human beings, because as intelligent as we are, as advanced as we are, now we have this thing called AI, as we are, all this is available, we still cannot come to know God by reason alone. Because our knowledge of God and our language of God is limited. It's very, very limited. Now, this picture that I have is on a photograph, right? Nobody was there to take his photo. It's just a picture, perhaps a portrait of St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the most intelligent persons, not just in the church, but in the world, still considered one of the most intelligent persons in the world. He died very young. He was about 50 when he died. Now, Thomas Aquinas wrote uh, this, this series called the uh, Summa Theologica, the Sum of Theology. If those of you are keen to find out more, go to the internet. There's lots of information. He was, wasn't the first, but he uh, was, his whole life was dedicated to writing out a systematic understanding of the church's belief, the church's theology, beginning from creation right up to revelation. So he wrote and he wrote in many volumes of books and he was greatly appreciated uh, even by people who are alive then. And, uh, and in fact, his parents didn't want him to become a monk. He was a monk. Okay? He was a P. OP means a Dominican monk. But he felt called by God just to dedicate his life to study and research and study and writing. And he wrote. And then one day, he had a vision. He had a vision in which, after seeing this vision, he never explained to anybody what this vision was. He just said, I can write no more. I've seen things that make my writings like straw. Okay? Like straw means like dry grass. It's worthless. After a revelation he received on 6 December 1273, here is one of the most intelligent men in history saying this. I have all that I've written is just straw. And he stopped writing from that moment onwards. And one month later, he died. One month later, he died. So this story symbolizes that Human intellect itself, as much as we can argue and, and write books, all the books we can read, we can still never know what is. And that is why, and that is why God revealed himself. Because God knew that his creatures, okay, they do not have the capacity to know him, to know him well. And because of his love, his tremendous love for each one of us. God revealed himself to us and he didn't have to reveal himself to us. God could have kept everything to himself and not even created human beings, not even created the world. He would have just said, said okay, I'm happy with myself. But God is not a selfish person. The very idea of the Holy Trinity shows that Father, Son and the Spirit sharing this communion of love, one God, but sharing this communion of love with one another and this is the communion that flows from the Holy Trinity to us. That is why the idea of God being alone, as uh, Bhagavan Solo, as we call it, our lone ranger, sitting there being alone, so lonely. Let's cry a bit. Huh? So lonely. But the fact that we have the Blessed Trinity itself, a communion of love, shows that God is one who shares this love, not just okay, in the form of the Father, Son, and the Spirit, but God shares his love with humanity. Therefore, God said, I want to share my love with, with someone, with someone. And so he created us to share his love. And you can only know God. You can only say, oh, I, I know the Bible. Because sometimes I ask, how can you know God? Oh, because we have the Bible, because we have the Mass, because we have the Eucharist. You can only know God because God has chosen to share himself with us. God has chosen to make himself known to us. Right. If not, we will be like any person in the in the deep in the jungle, which is not wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong. We will be like people deep in the jungle without having God's revelation. We will just use our 
we look at creation, we will look at other people, we look use our intellect and say, oh, we know this divine being, we know spiritual being, we know God. But no, because we, as Christians, we have this, this knowledge. I won't say extra knowledge, but in a way, it's this, this blessed knowledge given to us by God so that we can know him. Right? The word revelation comes from the Greek word apokalypsis, which means removal of a veil so that something can be seen. Something can be seen. Now, this is just for your information. So my dear friends, I hope that you will also go and do your own research. Our, our ideas of me and my idea is just to make you get to think and say, look, I want to find out more. So please do that. Now, Stephanie has already shared. Okay, I'm not going to repeat this, how God shared his love story, shared himself with humanity beginning from creation. Right Now, what is essential in this love story is that God made a covenant with humanity. Covenant is a sacred relationship. A sacred relationship between God and his people. He made the covenant with Abraham. He made the covenant with Noah. Right In Genesis 9, 11, you can read about that. And many of you know the story. And then you also know that God revealed himself, as Stephanie has shared, as a, to all the prophets, through the kings. And all these prophets proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. Right? Coming of the Messiah. Even though human beings have sinned, God remains faithful to man. God remains faithful to humanity. Now, what do you think would have happened if God said, okay, I love my, my, my people, I love my humanity, instead of revealing myself one after another from creation to Abraham to Noah, to okay, and then to the judges, to the kings, to the prophets. What if God said, here I am, everybody. Okay, what would happen to the world? Stephanie smiling. I can only see Stephanie smiling because no one else, not many of you are on video. What do you think would have happened? Anyone? Anything on the chat, Stephanie? They're, I think they're all thinking what would happen if God revealed himself to humanity all at once. The first answer, run away. Run away, yes. I don't know if you will be alive or not because in the presence of a holy God, we who are Overload. sinful. Overload. Some <laughs> might think he is a lunatic, frightened. Yes. People would think the world was ending. Yes. That's yes. why, hey, I often dream of this. Shock. Evil will be punished into eternal damnation. Um, not intriguing anymore. Alien. <laughs> Utter chaos. Yeah. Yes. Chaos. End of the world. A lot of people saying end of the world. Yes, okay. So God, if God had revealed himself, people think, oh, Abbas, la, Abbas, la, huh? gone already. So God was so kind. God not so, was so kind. He's so kind. He revealed himself gradually, step by step. So that we, as human beings, don't not think of human beings, just you and I and just now, you know, think of people right from the past. All the, how many centuries there were human beings and there were people in the Catholic Church 2,000 years ago. So the church is not just about us today. Let's not be self, in a way, sorry to say, it, selfish. To often think about ourselves. There is a way of thinking today called presentism. Presentism. That means only things in the present are important. What is in the past is outdated and not of any use. It's very prevalent in the world today. That means we remove what is not what is of the past. But Christianity is not a religion of, of faith of presentism. It's a faith rooted in history, rooted in God's revelation from the time of creation. So the people who come to me and say, Dr. Stephen, I think you should update your book. I should, it's not my book, sorry. Eh? I should do this, you should that. Falling into presentism because we fail to realize that our Catholic faith is not about what's happening today. We are not into a trend. Wherever we have LGBT today, okay, Dr. If I remove five topics from the, from the catechism, put up five topics on LGBT. Tomorrow, a few years down the road, creation is important. Let's remove 10 topics, of, you know, six topics from the MTS book put in creation. A catechesis is not about that. A catechesis, a catechism is a resource book, not a textbook. A resource book is about the essentials of our faith. The, the catechism is the essentials of God's revelation, the essentials of God's love story. We teach our children essentials, just the essentials. We can't go into detail because you don't have the time. You don't have the time. 
right? But also remember, from the, quite the time the, the children come into preschool or CGS, and they go from primary one, two, three, four, five, that is still the whole revelation is being shared with them, not just your class. Don't be entering the thinking of presentism that your class is the only class and the most important class. Uh, some people say, Doctor, I don't see this, I don't see that. I want to change the topics because I want to teach them about this. Bit. There is a process in the MCS series. I'm not here to protect the MCS series. You have to talk about God's revelation. So there is a process from primary one to form four. Everything, God's story is gradual. So the, the primary one teacher will start teaching something, primary two, primary three, primary four, build, build, build slowly. And after confirmation, we send them off, give them wings and let them fly and make mistakes. I'm going to go into preaching. I don't want to do that. All right now, Let's move on. So, of course, we know God's fullness of God's revelation was in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I want to quote here from Yuket. Okay? In Jesus Christ, God has poured out his heart to us. His whole heart has been given to us to Jesus and made his inmost being visible to us. Inmost being. Okay? God has poured out his heart. If you want to know God, no, come to know Jesus. Not know about Jesus. Oh, everybody can know about Jesus. Even the Muslim can know about Jesus. Even an atheist can know about Jesus by reading books and watching movies and getting uplifted by watching Chosen and all that. Yes, but we come to know Jesus. And how do you do that? Not just through prayer, please. Huh? Prayer is one way. There are many, many ways. And one important thing that just says that with Jesus, there is no further revelation. Right? And people are, there's no further revelation. If you receive something and you're sleeping and you receive some kind of a dream or vision, okay, that is that is nothing nothing new. It's all part of this, this love story of God that God has shared with us and God is sharing with us. So when Jesus came, he's the final revelation. That is why uh, St. John of the Cross, one of the very, uh, very interesting saints, says, in giving us his son, his only and definitive word, God spoke everything to us at once in this soul world. And he has no more to say. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Because in Christ, God has said everything he wants to say. So get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Okay, If you want to see how doctor, how you'll have many se another session for that. Or go to speak to your parish priest. Now, Islam claims that, uh, that Islam is the final revelation to mankind. The Holy Quran, right? No, no. For us Christians, Christ is the full stop. Christ is the full stop, meaning Christ is the final revelation. Let's not go to, some people are, some of you may even be going to Hinduism, pick something up, going to Buddhism, pick here. Oh, all this is very good. All this is interreligious. Interreligious dialogue is good, but be very careful. Get to know Christ. Right? All this is, is, if it helps you to know Christ, very good. If not, get to know Jesus. Read the Bible. Read the Bible again and again and again. One year, try to read the Bible from cover to cover. But you say, Doctor, no time. You have the time. And here I am preaching already, but never mind. We move on. All right? I hope some of you don't leave. Huh? How many? 59. 54 people left already, I think. So, okay. So, God's revelation. Jesus came and Jesus wanted to ensure that God's revelation, God's love story, is to be shared with all humanity. And that is why Jesus gave this very important commission that all of you are familiar with. All right, I'm not going to read that. You all can read for yourselves. Right now, so catechesis, the ministry that you and I are involved in, is the action of the church arising from the missionary mandate of Jesus. You see the word I've underlined that teach. Okay, teach. Teach them to observe all the commandments I have given you. So this is our aspect of our ministry, catechesis. So if we are a catechist, we are responsible for teaching, for teaching. Okay, the word is teach. The word is teach. You are catechist, right? To teach about God's love and God's revelation. That is from the time of creation, the revelation. Bringing from preschool to confirmation. Now, there are, the catechesis is beyond the classroom. We only have one hour. 
if you, if you know what catechesis means, it's beyond the classroom. It involves everyone in the community. But your specific call that God has placed in your life as a catechist or RCA catechist or TOB or CGS catechist, if you are a catechist today, if you are a parent, it's specifically for you to teach God's revelation or God's love. Right? Okay. Now, this God's revelation was revealed to us as, as Jesus had asked the disciples to go and, and teach. So, God's revelation has been shared, transmitted from time of the apostles today in two main ways, orally and writings. Now, I'm speaking to you, that's oral. Orally, okay? Now, I have this PowerPoint, that's writing. Compare eh, to so we have teaching and writing. For example, Paul, the Apostle Paul went to different parts of the Mediterranean. He preached, but he also wrote the epistles, the letters. So in these two main ways. And according to the church, over the centuries, both oral and written traditions, what has been handed down from orally and what has been handed down uh, in, in writing has been preserved and handed down in the church through two main ways. Sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Oh, I don't like this word sacred tradition. Sounds so old. Sounds so old. I only want sacred scripture. Bible, Bible, Bible. Huh? The Lord is only Bible is enough. I don't need sacred tradition. But please understand that God's revelation is come, has come down to us and is with us in these two main ways. Sacred scripture and sacred tradition. If you all know sacred scripture, it is the written word of God. Okay, it is the written word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. But what is sacred tradition? This is what we need to know. Sacred tradition, according to the Catholic Church, not according to Dr. Stephen Savaraju or some expert. Sacred tradition is the living word of God. The living word of God. Now, both these traditions, scripture and tradition, sorry, both these sources, both these modes, by which our God's revelation is being handed on, it comes to us in just two ways. It comes from the same source. Some people say, oh, sacred tradition is man-made, so I don't want. All this teaching about baptism, teaching about uh, confirmation, teaching about morality, all is man-made, man-made. Everything's in the Bible. You know, for Catholics, it's both. Because they come from the same source, Christ, the living and eternal word. Please note, Okay, I'm being very uh, specific here. If you talk about capital W, put that in red letters. That can, only Jesus Christ deserves a capital W. Now, okay, you can go and tell Father, Father, uh, Dr. Stephen said that, Father, but you're using capital W for Bible, Father. Uh, please don't go into that. I'm just sharing it with you. The capital W is only used in relation to Jesus Christ. The Word of God in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in John chapter 1. The other two formats of uh, scripture and and uh, and tradition has a small capital, so small capital pula, a small W, word of God. And you say, how can tradition? Okay, sorry, I've been dramatic. How can tradition be word of God, doctor? Yes, because it comes from the living and eternal word of God. Now let's explain the Bible. Most of us are familiar with. In the next session, I'll also cover the Bible a bit more. What is tradition? What is tradition? I don't understand. Is it lighting the candle? Is it uh, you know all these little things that we do? No, it's the life of faith of the church. It's more than the teachings and practices. It's the whole life. How the church has evolved from the time of apostles to today. Look at the variety of things we have in the church. Even the papacy, the Pope has has his source in. Pope uh, Peter, Pope Peter Pula, St. Peter, right? Then we have God, Mother Mary. Uh, where did all this evolve? 2,000 years of history that has evolved. It's living, it changes. Okay, it becomes new and then it becomes evolves. To, in another 100, 200 years, our faith may even be, the way the Catholic churches may even be different, but the essentials, God's revelation remains. The fundamentals remain. What we teach our children today will be taught in another hundred years' time, in terms of the faith, basically creed, sacraments, morals, and prayer. This will remain. This has remained the same for almost for centuries. Life experience will, will be different. Response of faith will be different. 
you all you all do that according to your lesson planning. Change it. But the word of God, the word of God is two parts. If you look at MCS series, there's always these two parts in the in the under the word of God. There is the scripture and there is the part on tradition. So it is the living life of faith. Just like when you look at your family, it's not just about you, presentism. No. Look at you had ancestors. And there, and they had ancestors. Ancestors go. If you trace it back to where you start, where it started, of course we do not know. I don't know. All I know is my my grandparents came from India. That's it. Okay, but which part of India? If you go and start investigating, you'll find that there is this whole life of faith, not life of faith, a life of tradition that you had, and that is why in some families they do certain things because it's part of the family's tradition. It is the same with the church. We have a sacred tradition. That has been that's two thousand years old, and this is interesting but very important. Okay? This is not again me quoting; it's from the CCC. All right, sacred scriptures and sacred tradition are bound closely together. You cannot have one without the other, because sacred scripture can fly. People start interpreting as they want. They say, "Oh, the Bible says this." Another fellow, another person, sorry, reading the same passage will say, "The Bible says that." And that's why people can argue about the sacred scripture. But what holds it together, what holds it together, keeps it on the ground, is sacred tradition. It's sacred tradition. It keeps it to the ground. All right? So, and they both come from the same divine self, wellspring, that is Jesus Christ. I mentioned to, to you about that. Now, this is a key line in, okay? This is not, uh, again, this is a key line in the teaching. The church does not de derive her certainty the church does not derive a certainty about all revealed truths from Holy Scriptures alone. So the Bible itself is only one aspect of the Word of God. Tradition is the other. They have to go together. They are bound closely together. Let me give you an example. We talk about Mother Mary. In today, we have four dogmas of Mary. For those who do not know, Mary is Mother of God, Mary is the Virgin Mary, Virgin Mary is the Mary as perpetual virgin. That means virgin before, during, and after the birth of Christ, the immaculate conception of Mary, and the assumption of Mary. In the scriptures, we find there are certain references to Mary. For example, Luke 1, 26-38, where the angel announces that Mary will be the mother of the Messiah. Now, the other four, Mary, mother of God, if you go to the Bible and you look, is there the word Mary being referred to as mother of God? If anyone says yes, all right, I'll, I'll put on my serious face. No, mother of the Lord, mother of, uh, you can even say mother of, but basically mother of the Lord. It's what but the mother of God came in the year 431. Council of Ephesus bestowed on Mary the title of mother of God, not because of Mary, but because of Christ. Every dogma the church has announced is not to promote Mary, but to promote, but to make clearer who Christ is. Because there was a there was a heresy that says that Jesus was not the was not divine, so in order by addressing by calling Mary Mother of God, it is to it is to confirm the divinity of Christ. Okay, I can go on and on. I get caught up with that. All right. So Mary, a perpetual virgin. Can you find it in the Bible? Yes, Mary was virgin before the birth of Christ. But what about during and after? There's no mention of that. Is there the word immaculate conception in the Bible? If anyone can tell me that, I'll give you one thousand ringgit, maybe more. The word Mary saying, I'm the Immaculate Conception. You cannot find in the Bible. You cannot find Mary's assumption in the Bible. All this is part of our tradition that has evolved over 2,000 years based on the reflection of the church on the person and message of Christ. It's all based on the person of Christ. Every tradition has evolved based on the reflection of who Christ is. So both sacred scripture and tradition must be accepted, dear friends, dear catechists, and honored with equal, equal, equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. Pay as much attention to the doctrines of the church, the liturgy, the sacraments, the moral teachings, the, all this as much as we devote to the Bible. And together they form the Word of God. Not capital W because only Christ is the capital W Word of God. And this is something that you need to know. Both are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because if it is, if, if tradition, sacred tradition is not inspired by the Holy Spirit, then don't pray to Mary. Don't have a reverence, don't have a devotion to Mary. Don't 
would have the supplements. We don't need to have the moral teachings. We don't need to pray. We don't need to do any of those things that are not in the Bible. Isn't it? It's, it's logical. Okay? Because uh, immaculate conception, assumption is not in the Bible. But we have a devotion to Mary. We have a feast day. Is this inspired by the Holy Spirit? If it's not, then don't follow this. Don't do it. But it's because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit that we are, have all these traditions. We call traditions by devotions and beliefs and the way we pray and honor Mother Mary. It's part of tradition that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we need to have this kind of... I, I told myself I'll not show my hands on screen. No? So I put it down again. Um, we need to understand what tradition is. And I can't explain it to you in detail because it is so rich. So what makes you, how does it make you feel when you hear both sacred tradition, sacred tradition constitute the word of God? I know people say, oh, doctor, but in the liturgy, you know, we read, uh, after reading the thing, we say the word of the Lord, the word of God. Yes, it is capital W, word of God. It is one aspect of the word of God. It's the tradition as well. All right. So how does it make you feel? Some of you may be hearing this for the first time. Some of you may have heard this before. I've given sessions on this. People are so astounded they have nothing to say. Right, Stephanie? All right. So please note, this is not, this is theology. Huh? This is basically what the church teaches. Scripture and tradition are bound together. Scripture and tradition must be given honor equally. Given honor equally. All right? Um that it feels good. Uh, another said it is complete and living. Uh, feeling of peace in mind. Uh, another one said they feel intrigued. Okay. It feels so, complete. Scripture complete. and tradition are together. That's what St. Paul had said. Mm. Uh, grateful. The mystery of God is profound. Amazed. In Amazing. all, because, uh. yes. In all it means that we are repeating what Jesus' disciples have been doing since the time of the resurrection. Okay. All right. So remember, sacred scripture is written and it cannot be changed. Not the, okay, as Jesus himself said, okay, he didn't come to change, he came to give it life. So sacred scripture, as we have it today, cannot be changed. But sacred tradition can. It evolves. The way we celebrate the Mass after Vatican II, after 1965, 66. Those of you who are aware, it has changed from the time it was before. If you trace it down to the 2,000 years, the way we celebrate the Eucharist has evolved, evolved, evolved to something, something new and new and new in accordance to the needs of the people, the time. Okay, But it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the scriptures do not change. The words remain as they are for 2,000, for, not for 2,000, for, for the centuries and centuries remain as they are. But so they need each other. That's if another... we don't, I'm sorry. There are more answers, Doctor. Do you want to hear them? Uh, let me just explain this, Stephanie. Now, if we do not have scripture, tradition will become all outdated and it becomes very, very rigid. That's the problem. If we have scripture without tradition, scripture can fly. Okay, but then a tradition holds it to the ground. So they need each other. Without scripture, tradition, you know, people start. Uh, Coming very, it has happened in the church, becoming very legalistic and things like that. That's why scripture gives it, gives breeds life into tradition. Yes, Stephanie? Ah, okay. So there are other responses in the chat. Um, makes total sense. Not everything is written down. It's logical. Uh, feel reassured because we cannot find all the answers from the Bible, such as the sacraments. Yeah. Sacred tradition is physical presence of God to draw attention of worshippers. Sacred scripture needs to be pondered in the heart. Okay, that is why if you have a, a, a friend or a neighbor who comes to you and say, uh, y'all uh, y'all are worshipping Mary, that uses the Bible and says, y'all are doing the, y'all are not following the Bible. You know what I mean? Nah? They keep on saying that. And you feel guilty. You know, yeah, I, I went through the Bible. Uh, I turned it upside down. I read every page. There's no mention of immaculate conception. What to do? I'm so sad. No? The father, father said, oh, father, I go to someone and the person said, go to father and you're scared of father. Okay. So, no, whenever we, we as Catholics are in discussion, not in the, not arguing with a Protestant brother and sister, do not just take a, take the Bible with you. Take the CCC along. 
if you have a copy of the CCC, take it along because you say, for us, the word of God, both of these constitute the word of God. Therefore, if we want to talk about Mother Mary, let me refer to the CCC. They say, cannot be, it's only the Bible. Afterwards, I'll explain to you how that came about. I felt I needed to do, share this first because it kind of connects what Stephanie has shared and what I'll be sharing later. So you know, when we talk about a, a discussion with any of our Christian brethren, cannot truly totally be focused on the Bible and do not feel ashamed that, that you do not find all the answers in the Bible. Right? And I will also explain later the role of tradition in the creation of the Bible. The role of tradition in the creation of the Bible, I'll explain later. Right? Anything else, Stephanie? Any amazing other response? Any uh, responses? There are two more. Uh, living and true. The last one, I feel blessed. Amen. Okay. So, but then who holds this together? Okay? Who ensures the scripture is, is protected, not changed? Who holds uh, in scripture? Because even today, there are people who are, sorry to use this, playing the fool with scripture. Right? For example, they want a more inclusive language. So there is a Bible that says everywhere there is a God, there is also and mother, father, God. Jesus is a father and he says father and they add in and mother. They want to make it more inclusive. I mean, gender friendly. Okay. So, uh, for example, even baptism, baptism. Okay. Some priests, instead of saying the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they say the name of the Father and mother. Yes. It's happening in the Europe. Okay, and then so uh, that is why the church needs to constantly check to see that a baptism, if a priest, if you are baptized by a priest who said the uh, God, Father, and Mother, your baptism is invalid. Right? So this, these things are creeping in. So the church, who's going to ensure that the Bible and tradition is protected and safeguarded? Who ensures that the tradition, the change of this tradition from generation to generation, for example, from Vatican II, after Vatican II, we have new new ways of uh, celebrating the Eucharist, the new, I won't say new, but reformed, a different way of celebrating the Eucharist is actually what God wants. It is the magisterium. Right? The magisterium is from the, it's from the Greek word, teaching, teacher. That's where you get the word, um, the, the magistra, in the uh, magistra, the teacher. It's the teaching office of the church. And who forms the teaching of the teaching office of the church? Not Dr. Stephen. And not involved. It's the Pope and all the bishops in the world, all the bishops in the world who are, who are alive, of course. That is, our Archbishop Julian is part of the magisterium. He has placed his role as the magisterium here in, in, in our Archdiocese. Cardinal Sebastian placed the role of the magisterium in his, in his diocese. They don't only, only when they gather together for a meeting, it's not magisterium. Okay, it's where they are. The bishops play the role of the magisterium. So it's the role of the bishop to safeguard, ensure. Okay, for example, if someone produces a new Bible, he has to check and see whether this Bible is in accordance with the teachings of the East, accordance with the church. Or someone comes out with some teaching and says, Oh, I saw I saw a vision of Mary in Subang Jaya Hospital, the window there, the stained glass. You all remember a few years ago? Stephanie was too young then, maybe she was in primary school. So there was, there was <laughs> I, mean, I always pull a leg. Lah. Some of you may be not even be born there. Yeah, they say, oh, there's my vision of Mother Mary. You all remember somewhere in Subang Hospital, I think, somewhere there. And then they, okay, the Pope, the Pope, the, the bishop has to be involved and to ensure that this is authentic or not. And what, how does he do it? By going back to scripture tradition, reflecting on it. Okay, there are certain ways, certain criteria by which you will know. And so it's the magisterium has this place to play a very important role. And okay. Archbishop Julian, yes, okay. please. Someone Sorry? was working there. Oh, you're working there. Okay, yeah, so everybody is so excited. People are praying the rosary and then obstructing the traffic, I think. Right now, after a while, you see what happened? That stained glass, I think, was removed and then taken to a church. And then now, it's, I don't know whether it's people are even talking about it today. Right, there was a guy I know somewhere in Sramban. I won't say where he found a stone. He found a stone in a river, and he said he resembled the face of Christ. And he went. He made this announcement that he has that Christ has is is given him this gift, and he put it in his house. And then people began to flock to his house, all over different parts of Sramban and then different parts of Malaysia to look at the stone, the face that resembled Christ, the stone that resembled Christ. After a while, the priest went took the stone. 
away and gave it to the bishop, decided it wasn't, okay, it was, look, it's, this is not done simply, it's done out of a lot of reflection and prayer. So this is the role of the magisterium, the Pope and all the bishops. Please note, the bishop has the fullness of the priesthood. The priest shares in his fullness. Without the bishop, there is, cannot be a priesthood, be a priest, huh? Okay, there's another topic. Like, I don't want to get carried away. Just take note. The bishop has got the fullness of priesthood because he receives three ordination. The ordination as a deacon, ordination as a priest, and ordination as a bishop. The others, only two ordinations. The bishop has the fullness of ordination. Three in one. Let's go on. But then don't go and tell your parish, please. Lah. Father, Father, Dr. Stephen said you only got two thirds. No, uh, not like that. This is theology. Wait. There's a question, Doctor. Yes. Is the deposit of faith more important than the apparitions? Than what? Is Sorry? the deposit of faith more important than the apparitions? Of course. What's the deposit of faith? God's revelation. God's love story from the time of creation to today. All that is that is the deposit of faith as handed down to us through secret scripture and tradition. It is, it is, it is, when you look, have an apparition, it is, it is the, it is true, the magisterium. I don't know why I cannot forward my slide. Let me try. Oh, okay, now, wonderful. Look at this uh, stool down there. All right, I'm sorry, it's the image of a stool, not I draw, I just took it from the internet. The Catholic Church, we need these three. Scripture, tradition, and magisterium. They go together. Now, the magisterium is the teaching office. It is not a doctrine, okay? It is not a doctrine. It is the, the body that oversees scripture and tradition. Now, if you have an apparition, now the, okay, so the magisterium will reflect on it in line of scripture and tradition, in line with scripture and tradition. And then there is certain criteria by which they will judge whether the apparition is authentic or not. All this is based on God's revelation. They will judge, they will judge whether it's authentic or not. In making in, in calling uh, apparition authentic, they do not see how many people are going there. They do not see how many miracles are taking place. They do not see about how many times the sun spins. They do not see how many times Mary appears. No. The main criteria by which they consider an apparition of Mary, for example, really is are people experiencing conversion. When someone goes for a pilgrimage, comes back, is there a conversion in that person? Based on the person's testimony. And so, for example, Lutz and Fatima, the two main uh, places of a pilgrimage, apparition of Mary, has been fully declared valid by the church because of the number of conversions that have taken place, not healing. The others are considered good, but still under investigation. Many are still under investigation. The church still hasn't said no completely, but hasn't said completely yes. Only these two have been fully given the green light fully, but the rest still can go on. We can still go pilgrimage. I'm not saying that they are not true, but the church is giving many years, many, many, many years to study and to reflect. All right. So even if the revelation of God is complete in Jesus, it has not been made completely clear. It remains for Christian faith. It remains for us, theologians, priests, bishops, to continue to grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. And that is why from the time of Jesus Christ until today, we have sacred tradition because the church is trying to understand God's revelation. After us, after me, then people, young people like Stephanie and her TL, people of her age, and then after that, children, grandchildren, whoever, they will continue to, 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 to understand God's revelation because God's revelation is complete in Jesus but is not fully understood, not fully made clear. Look at Protestantism, they've only got one chair. I'm not making a, a fun of it. All right? So this is why a pastor who doesn't agree with another pastor on a scripture passage can say, I don't agree with you, I form my own church. And then he can go, or he or she can go and form his own church. But for us, we have these three solid, uh, these solid uh, aspects in our church, scripture, tradition, and this is then safeguarded and handed down by magisterium. So coming back to our starting point, Catechesis 
arises, eh? it's a ministry that arises from the missionary mandate of Jesus for us to teach, to teach, to teach. That is a specific calling. In that one hour, 45 minutes to one hour, you are called to teach. People will say, oh, classes are boring. Uh, this one is that. Don't try to be a comedian, please. I know some people try to be a comedian. Some people try to be a magician. Some people try to do certain things to, 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 you know, to attract the children's attention. Be a creative teacher. Be an engaging teacher. Be a, a, a hardworking teacher who prepares your lesson. You don't need to, 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 to be a juggler, you know, juggling. And to, if you prepare well and you and you and you and prepare your lessons creatively and you prepare with, with your whole heart, that lesson will be engaging. The preparation is essential. You as your role of a teacher is okay, teach creatively. We don't need to add extras. Now, as I said, it's only one hour. The rest has to take place outside the classroom. That's another big area that I, I can't get into. So you just do your part that God has called you to be a okay, be one who transmit the faith to your children creatively, engagingly, and so on. So I leave you with this. So this is why, my dear brothers and sisters, a catechism resource book is so important for you to refer to it when you're preparing your lessons and you're teaching your lessons. Amen. How's time? How's our time, Stephanie? <laughs> On time, right? Oh, I missed. Okay, I pass the floor to you. So, the schedule, we are supposed to have a break after the second session until 11.45. Uh, now it's actually 11.26. Uh, should I proceed? Should we proceed with a little extra long break since we had Less time for the other break. Maybe one question, if I can answer in four minutes. Uh, sure. Any any questions? Anyone who has a question for Dr. Stephen can post it into the chat. Either they are very astounded or they are very shocked or they are very surprised. But please note, okay? Please note this again. I never want, I, I don't like, I prefer not to teach based on experts. I often go back to the church. We haven't got any training for CCC. Mm. If Isidore, if you are Isidore, the Isidore that I know, uh, Dr. Stephen, so continue with the MCS series. Of course, it's, this decision is not made by me just because I wrote the secondary series. Uh, Isidore, I'll come back to you. This is uh, the MCS series. I wrote the secondary book. I mean, from uh, level six to from four. All right. Now there have been people calling me and asking me for update, update, update. I just give them two responses. One, uh, I'm too old to, to to update anything now. Okay. I just want to complete uh, certain things that I have got into my heart and retire. That's it. Okay. Retire for good reason. Okay. That one is another story. Secondly, is the magisterium who is deciding that we change. Uh, is the magisterium that decides that we change, do not change the textbooks, and that is the bishops of Malaysia. They decided, no, you see, the, the, the ones who are having issues are the ones in the cities, the urban ones, but else the Bahasa speaking, Tamil speaking, mainly Mandarin speaking, and those in the, in the, in the semi-urban rural parishes seem quite happy with the book. So they say carry on. Right? So yes, continue using the book. Will CCC be changed, updated as theology understood? Of course, of course, uh, yes, right. The first new so catechism came out in eighteen seven. No, eighteen seven. It was the Council of Trent, 1563. 1563. You no, know, fifteen sixty three is when the council ended. Fifteen sixty seven, I think. All right, I think somewhere. Now then, after see how many centuries we got the CCC in, uh, nine in twenty no nineteen ninety two. Nineteen ninety two. 1994 was the English version, Stephanie. 1992 was the first French version. Anyway, okay. So you see a gap of 300 years, almost three to 400 years before the next cate universal catechism came up. So it will change maybe in a few hundred years from now. Okay, coming back to uh, no session on CCC. Huh? I've been giving training on CCC. Uh, okay, I, th I think Isidore, you entered, I'm not sure if this is Isidore, you attended the first session on the JCCC course. 
maybe you're the not the easy dog. Okay, I, we did. I, I did do a training on the CCC. Right. Aaron asked, "Must we obey the magisterium, or is there room for debate?" If you're talking about issue with the parish priest, you don't agree with him about certain things. That is not. Uh, uh, oh, okay, okay. Didn't attend. Okay, yes, yes. Now I understand. Is the dog. All right. Uh, it depends on the issue itself. All right. Because your parish priest also may not know the issue properly. You also may not you see even our parishes, the much as they are learned in theology, may not know the, the real essence of a particular topic. So we go back to magisterium. Every time we go back to the magisterium. What does the church say? That's why for me it's important. I go back to what the church says, and not what uh, experts say, or what priests say, or what this person says. Okay, so with that, uh more than four minutes to release afternoon. Yes, uh, now it's ele exactly 11.30. Uh, we will have our break from now until 11.45. If you have any other questions, you can uh, you can type it into the chat and we will see if we have time at the end of today to uh, address those questions. Thank you very much. See you all in at 11.45. Okay, there is a question here. Does the magisterium also act as the check and balance? For in the church, yes, that's the main role of the magisterium. Um, so the priest is supposed to be the check and balance in the parish, the bishop in the diocese, and the all the bishops in the world and the pope be the back, a check and balance in the world. Right. So the responsibility of the bishop doesn't just limit; it's not just limited to his diocese. He shares. In what is known as the collegiality, collegiality. The word college means a body, right? a body that has this connection with one another. That is why, if there are any major issues in the diocese, the bishop will try to resolve the problem internally. But if not, he'll refer the case to Rome. So there is this connection, this constant connection, because the bishop of the bishop, the pope himself is only is actually a bishop. He's the bishop of Rome. And whoever is the bishop of Rome becomes the pope. It's not by virtue that that, that he is that the pope is uh, above the 